with us today. We're so happy to have you guys. Yeah, woohoo. And I was, I've been trying to grow a garden. So we moved into this flat and it's kind of this mess and we've been trying to grow. So like my last task after we cleared everything out was to plant grass and I've been like at it, throwing down seed like crazy, even when it's too cold, even when like the birds come and sweep it up. And um, I just thought like a couple weeks ago, I thought this grass is never going to grow because it's supposed to take two, I've been researching grass online, two weeks to germinate, you know, like it's been like six weeks. And then all of a sudden this week, it started to shoot up from the dirt. And I was like, yes, just when I thought nothing was happening, it's coming. And I've been looking at pictures of Steve and Molly. I've been looking at pictures of old old pictures. You guys, did, did you just celebrate an anniversary or some things like that recently? Yeah, and just some younger pictures, thinking about you guys and all the seeds you guys have thrown down over the years and lives that you don't even realize that have been sprouted up and changed and, and touched because of you guys and what you do and how faithful you guys are. And I always think it's such a privilege to have Steve and Molly with us in our tiny little church because I feel like they're like a powerhouse and we're just so blessed to have them. And so would you guys stretch out your hand to them? We want to pray over you guys. We want to bless you today. Reach out your hand. If you're a kid, reach out your hand. We're going to pray for Stephen Molly. God, I just pray a blessing and just an anointing upon this beautiful, wonderful couple, God. F how faithful they've been over the years, through the years, through the ups and downs. And God, their family now, even today, is just ministering in different parts of the United Kingdom, God. Their families are being blessings to the areas that they serve in, God. And I just pray, Father, that you would just speak through Steve today, Father, that our hearts would would be prepared and ready to receive. And we just thank you for this couple. I pray that you would bless them financially. I pray that you would bless them with health, God, with, with just new opportunities to serve you, Father, and just um, pour into their lives, Lord God, that they would still continue uh, with just every day to serve you with all of their hearts and all of their souls and all of their minds and spirit. God, we just thank you for Steve and Molly, and we just honor them today as he comes to share. Just get our hearts ready and our ears ready to listen to what you have to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on up, Steve. There's water for you here. And the children, yeah, the children can be dismissed. You took kids' church, and I'll take you guys out. Praise God. Well, it's good to be here uh, with uh, all our friends from BFC. And uh, it's true to say that we miss you very much uh, every, every week. And we tune in to see what the different uh, services are producing, what, who's preaching, who's uh, doing the worship and so on. So it's always, always good. Thank you, Julie, for that wonderful introduction. I'm not really sure I was wondering who it was she was uh, uh, talking about, but uh, we'll take that the, this morning. Praise, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, it's interesting looking back to see the changes that come into all of our experience. And some of you are very young still yet, and, and even looking back on your own journey, uh, uh, you know that you, things have changed. You've uh, grown and your physical appearance has changed a little bit and so on. But for those of us who are a little bit more on the journey, as it were, Mary, we, uh, we look back and we see some uh, rather more generous changes to our physical appearance and so on. And really, the, the series that we've been looking at over the weeks and we've been tuning into. Yeah, hear what's been said, Ian, last week, and Pastor Dave the week before that, and so on. Uh, race to life. Hallelujah. And isn't that great this morning that we can rejoice and that we can lift up the name of Jesus? We worship a living Savior. 
We'll worship a God who is caring and interested now in our situation and relationships. We don't worship an empty tomb. We don't go to some festival to raise up some candle or incense to some deity that's uh, mythical in the centuries before. We worship a living Savior who died and rose again from the dead and promised that through faith we know eternal life. Hallelujah. And we can rejoice together this morning. And that's really what I want to uh, push our thinking, our thoughts this morning in the verses which Pastor Dave so kindly uh, gave me to uh, bring to you this morning. Amen. And so turn to your Bibles then, uh, uh, in whatever form it is, whether it's uh, on your phones or whatever, to John chapter 20 and verse 24, and we'll read these verses together. They probably will come up, I think. So, now Thomas, called Dynamis, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Hallelujah. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Hallelujah. Praise God. And let's pray God's blessing over his word to us this morning that it will come alive uh, in our hearts and in our, in our minds this morning. Now, the majority of commentators uh, uh, writing about Thomas and about this incident uh, here in the scripture in John uh, describing this incident, they're fairly scathing about Thomas's attitude. Uh, and of course, most of the world uh, know him by the nickname Doubting Thomas. Uh, and if you even people who are not normal churchgoers would talk about Doubting Thomas, they'll know who it is you're referring to, of course. Uh, they use it to label that nickname, to label anyone who has doubts about buying into a scheme or an event or something, and you're saying, well, this is what's going to happen, and they say, oh, that'll ne never happen. Oh, you doubt, doubting Thomas, and they, people get labeled with that same name. However, I want to stop there, and I want to say I personally am really glad uh, this morning that John included this event into his description of the events after Jesus rose again from the dead. It, be, it gives us so much insight into the way that Jesus re, uh, handled Thomas's reaction and the fact that Thomas was not there when the, uh, Jesus first appeared to the disciples. So let's look at some of the key elements right here in this event then that will help us this morning, I trust, to tackle some of our own doubts. Oh, did I actually say that? Because... It is a fact that we do have doubts at times. And all of us have that moment when we think, will that really happen? Or does that really happen? And so let's tackle our own doubts as we look at the way Thomas tackled, or rather Jesus helped Thomas to tackle his doubts. Now the first thing that we see here is this. Thomas was missing. Now, that's, it. that's key. It's important for us to realize that, that Thomas was missing. When we began to read in the Scripture, it says the disciples were all met together. <coughs> Excuse me. The di disciples were all met together, and Jesus appeared amongst them, but Thomas was not there. So Thomas was missing. When the disciples gathered together, 
after Jesus' death, and then the reports that were coming in about the fact that some of the, uh, the women had seen him, uh, when some of the disciples had gone to the tomb, and they had seen it was empty. They'd heard all this, and they had gathered together, but Thomas was not there. The writer doesn't explain why Thomas wasn't there. He doesn't elaborate on the detail. He doesn't tell us why it was that Thomas wasn't there. But the fact that he mentioned it is significant. The events that had happened were traumatizing. The disciples, they had all seen all their hopes and all their dreams for Jesus dashed. And their own lives had been in jeopardy. They ran away. They were frightened for the fact that they may be arrested and put to death. And now they were locking themselves in the room, afraid of reprisals against them by the Jewish leaders. They were sticking together, if only for safety. They were looking out for one another. And yet, Thomas was not there. You would have thought that Thomas would have wanted to be there. You would have thought that Thomas would have made it a priority to be there. Because if for, not, for no other reason than just to be uh, uh, together to talk about all the events that had happened and also for the fact that he was be protected because he was with the other disciples. But of course, we have to be fair. He may have had a good reason for being absent. You know, some family crisis may have came up. Uh, some event uh, may be happening that he had to go. He had to be there. You know, it's true that we can always find a reason for missing out, for missing an opportunity for meeting together. But what is our heart's desire? What is the reason why we want to meet together? I remember as a teenager growing up in the church in Musselboro, and that's many a year ago, um, our pastor's wife at that time, uh, she was, uh, they were both from Aberdeen, actually, the, the pastor and his wife. Uh, she used to always say this. She used to say, I never want to miss a meeting because it will just be that meeting when God turns up and something amazing happens and everyone will talk about it and I won't be there. And she was quite genuine. She, was, she said, that will never happen. I will always want to be there. And I remember her talking about that. You should think, whoa, that is definitely passionate. She wants to not miss out. And it's true. Thomas was missing and Thomas missed out. The risen Jesus appeared to his disciples. He confirmed to them, this is who I am. Look, look the wounds in my hands and my feet, my side. But Thomas was not there. Jesus blessed them. The word of God says that he breathed on them. Oh, what an, an amazing experience that must have been when you think about, you know, all the detail. Those disciples talking about these things afterwards with different people, re repeating their stories and saying, Jesus breathed on us. And everybody's eyes wide open in amazement at saying, uh, that uh, Jesus had breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. My goodness, what an experience. But Thomas missed out. Thomas was not there. He missed out on one of the most amazing events the world would ever witness. And of course, he missed out on the blessing. You and I this morning, I want to encourage and challenge us this morning. Don't miss out. Don't be missing when it may happen that you will miss out on the blessing, miss out on what God wants to deliver into your life in that occasion. The pastor may be bringing a word that is very specifically meant to be spoken deeply into your heart and soul, but you're not there. And I want to encourage us, be there. Hebrews chapter 10 always uh, reminds us, and let's not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another. And especially now that the day of his return is drawing nearer. Yes, 
let's not miss out like Thomas missed out. The second key element is this. Notice that when the disciples had met and Jesus appeared to them, they were excited about what had happened, and they were wanting to tell everyone. And Thomas, especially, Thomas, you'll never believe it. You've missed out. You should have been here and telling Thomas all about it. But Thomas was reluctant. He was reluctant. And first of all, we see the reason for his reluctance. He called, he said to the rest of the disciples, sorry, let, sorry, let, I apologize. Let's see what the reason is for Thomas's uh, reluctance. He was absent when Jesus first appeared to his disciples, and he can't believe their report. I wonder if his attitude, this negativity that he had, goes back to perhaps some, something in his character. The Word of God tells us in John chapter 11, verse 16, uh, that Thomas, called Dinamis, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. He had a pessimistic kind of attitude. He kind of said, well, okay, let's just go along then. Uh, they're going to put him to death. We may as well go and die along with him. Others say that this was a very brave statement. He, he was kind of sticking up and saying, right, okay, come on, let's all go together, and we'll, we'll fight for you, Jesus, and we'll die for you, Jesus. But actually, the majority of people are believing that, that Thomas is a little bit pessimistic. Oh, we might as well go. We'll all die together. Is that the kind of attitude that Thomas had? Is that why he reacted the way that he did when they were telling him about this wonderful resurrection. Jesus is alive. No, he can't be alive. I saw him die on the cross. It's impossible. I saw him buried in the tomb. No, it's impossible. Maybe this negative attitude. Throughout the Gospel of John, Thomas is depicted as this grumpy, pessimistic person who always saw the negative in everything. You know, life's journey can be like that for us too, though. You know, life does throw some curveballs. It does throw some uh, events and situations, circumstances into our path that can make us feel rather negative. We feel as if nothing ever goes right. It's always somebody else who gets the job. It's always somebody else who gets the pay rise. It's always somebody else who gets the husband. It's never you. It's always somebody else. And it's going to think, well, that's negative, a, a negative way to look at things. But, you know, I want to encourage us this morning. Yes, it's true. Let's be realistic. We don't hide our heads in the sand and pretend that everything's all rosy. We know that life can be very hard. We know that it can be painful. We know that events, situations, relationships, circumstances can actually cause us intense pain. But let us not just look on the negative of everything, but help us to understand this. That in Romans 8, 28, it says this, that we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. In other words, there is a bigger picture in your life and in mine. It's not just the small, narrow events and circumstances that surround you. It's the bigger picture in which you are a major part in which God has a plan. And God always has plan A. He never has plan B. Praise God. And so think of that in your experience. Think of that in your journey, in your event, the events that happen and circumstances that happen in your experience, in your life. There is a bigger picture. But I want to challenge us a little bit about the reaction of Thomas. You know, I wonder if Thomas had that reaction that we sometimes have. You know that uh, reaction that when you're having a little discussion and maybe a little bit of a disagreement about something? Uh, you know, maybe Molly says, right, okay, uh, uh, where are we going for a walk today? And uh, I'll say, well, where do you want to go? And she'll say, well, um, 
uh, I'm not really sure. Where do you want to go? And so it goes backward and forward a little bit like this. And then, you know, uh, Molly will say, uh, well, what about going down by the coast? And I'll say, well, it's a bit cool down there today. Why don't we go up by the farm instead? And so we have this little discussion going on. And then eventually, you know, Molly says, uh, grudgingly says, well, yeah, okay then, we, we go, we'll go your, your way then. And then I'll say, no, actually, I'm not going that way now. We're going to go down the coast. That's it. And that's sometimes what we do, isn't it? You know, the person that we're discussing things with, we, it turns out we know in our hearts that they're right about what they're saying, but we're not going to actually admit to that or give in, are we, to that. We're going to say, well, actually, right, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do that anyway. And I wonder if Thomas had a little bit of this attitude. You know, when the, when the disciples said, you should have seen it. Jesus, it was just amazing. And, and Thomas is going, well, actually, I'm not going to believe unless, you know, I can really see the nail prints and put my hand in his side. I'm not going to believe that kind of attitude. And I want to encourage us that sometimes, you know, we may be tempted to, to, to be that negative attitude. And I want to discourage us. Help us to realize that we need to work together to be able to achieve the best results. We know it's not a right attitude, but many of us are guilty of doing this. You know, was Thomas actually reacting like this? He may have been. He makes these demands. I'm not going to unless. We'll talk about that in a moment. They almost feel petty, don't they, those demands. When you think about the bigger picture, you think, whoa, you know, I'm not going to believe unless, you know, I put my finger in the nail prints and my hand uh, in, the, in the, his side. You almost feel like a child stamping its feet in the, in the supermarket at the, at the sweets aisle and demanding, you know, I'm not going to move unless I get a packet of crisps. Uh, you know, it almost feels like that. I'm not going to go, I'm not moving until I get you know this, or I want that, and I'm not moving until I get it, stamping his feet until he gets what he wants. But it's easy to condemn Thomas. But I think many of us are more like Thomas than we want to admit. Whoa, did I, did I actually say that? Oh, my word. But it's true. I think more of us are. And, you know, look at this requirement that Thomas demanded. He won't believe unless he sees and touches the wounds of Jesus. I wonder if we're tempted at times to put requirements on our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember the story of a young fisherman when I was growing up. Well, actually, I was, uh, um, I was probably early 20s at the time, if I remember rightly, uh, late teens or early 20s at the time. And this young fisherman whose uh, fishing boat was shipwrecked off the coast of Scotland and he was thrown onto the rocks. He managed to scramble onto the rocks. And the sea was pounding him. And the uh, uh, story went like this. He, he thought he was going to drown. So he called out to God to rescue him. He, he said, Lord, if you save me, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. And just then, another fishing boat was coming by. It was usually uh, traveled around from the, the west coast of Scotland to the east coast in pairs, usually to look out for one another in those days, uh, before radar and all the other things that they have now. And uh, this other boat was coming close by and saw them and was able to, to rescue them. The trouble is, unfortunately, his service, that his requirements, the demands that he made, you know, I will if you will. Uh, and not long after that, he, he stopped following the Lord and uh, drifted away and no longer uh, uh, served the Lord or attended uh, worship and so on. Unfortunately, it didn't last. You can't put demands or boundaries on the Lord. There are times <clears throat> when we say things to the Lord like, you know, if you really love me, you will give me this job. I wonder if anyone's been uh, tempted into that situation where, you know, they... Uh, they, they've been tempted to say that to the Lord, you know, if you really love me, you'll, you'll let me have this job, you'll, you'll let me have this pay rise, you'll, you'll do this, you'll allow me to do that. And, you know, we make demands on the Lord. 
without really thinking through the big plan, thinking through the purpose that God has for us individually into that situation. When we come to Christ, when we come to the Lord, we must come <clears throat> simply with faith. And we'll see that in a moment. The next element is this. So here we are. Yeah, Thomas has made his uh, declaration. He said, no, I, I'm not going to believe unless, you know, I see this, this, this. And then they're all gathered together again. And Thomas was with them. And I like that because it sounded as if Thomas has thought to himself, I mean, I'm not going to miss out again. At least that's something very positive, isn't it, in this? He's saying to himself, well, you know, I missed out the last time. If this is really true, I don't want to miss out again. So he's there with them the next week. And so the Word of God says in the NLT version, and I like that version, it says this, Jesus suddenly appeared. Jesus suddenly appeared among them. Not all the versions have the word suddenly there. But of course, if you're in a locked room and then suddenly, and somebody just turned up, it is a bit sudden, you know, a little bit unexpected, you know, a little bit Star Trek really in a way, you know, kind of like, Zoo. and so, you know, I often smile about that because, you know, all those unbelievers, you know, watching Star Trek. Anyway, moving on from there quickly. You know, Jesus suddenly appeared among, and I love that. I like it because <clears throat> it gives me a wonderful excitement in my heart that no matter what the circumstance I'm in, no matter what the event is that's happening around me, I know that Jesus can suddenly appear. He can, his presence can suddenly come amongst us, come into my situation. It gives me encouragement. It it inspires me because no event, no circumstance, no, no matter what it is, is too impossible for Jesus to appear. Isn't that great? You know, the door was locked. The Word of God actually describes it. It, it, it puts it out there. It says, the door was locked. It's not like, oh, you know, this is, you know, some magic trick, you know. It, the door was locked. They were they are afraid of the reprisals. And then suddenly, Jesus appeared among them. And what an encouragement it must have been to them. And notice this as well, that straight away, Jesus <coughs> gave Thomas a telling off. No, he didn't. And that's what I love about our Lord Jesus, that no matter what the situation is, the first thing he said to them was, Peace, peace, peace to you. He realized that everything was in a mess, in a muddle. Their whole emotions and everything was all in an upheaval. And, they knew, and he knew that they needed that peace in their hearts. And that was the very first thing that he said to them, peace to you. The manifestation of Jesus. He suddenly appeared. Wow. I love that, that he appeared among them. You know, the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, sometimes we talk about it quite often, don't we? You know that the Lord is here and so on. And the people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior have no idea what we mean, what we talk about. But we who love the Lord know what that means. We understand what it means for the presence of the Lord to suddenly come among us and for His blessing to be in our uh, service or in our midst, whatever it might be. We understand that. And here Jesus comes amongst them suddenly into the situation. And His words are not of rebuke, but of encouragement, peace. And I love that. And we see here that Jesus gave Thomas an invitation. He said to him, come on then, Thomas. Put your fingers, put your hands. See, here's my wounds. The invitation to Thomas. He didn't, he actually came to a rebuke of Thomas. But he came through the fact that Thomas had said, 
I won't believe unless. And Jesus said, believe, Thomas. Stop doubting and believe. Through his demands, he focuses the connection on restoring Thomas's faith. Time and time again, when we doubt or when we rebel against Jesus or sin, Jesus reaches out and gently offers us restoration. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I love that story in the, in the Word of God that says that the shepherd had a hundred sheep, and one went missing. And what did he do? Jesus told the story. He said the shepherd uh, puts the other 99 there and leaves them in somebody's care. And off he goes, looking for the one who is lost. That is the Jesus that we serve. Hallelujah. He cares about the individual. He cares about you. He cares about your situation. He cares about your circumstance. And that's what he's saying here with Thomas. All the disciples are there. He's blessed them. Peace be with you. But then he turns his attention to the one who was saying, I won't believe unless. And Jesus ministers to him right there in that situation. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ that we love and serve and that we are I want to encourage you with this morning to realize that no matter what's going on, that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to minister into your situation. Hallelujah. Jesus said in Matthew 19, let the little children come to me because the kingdom of God is, belongs to these. John 7, 37, he says, Jesus stood up and in a loud voice, he said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And all these are different uh, illustrations of how the Lord Jesus can minister into your need, can satisfy the situations that are going on in your circumstance. Hallelujah. What an impact those words made on Thomas. And we see here the adoration that Thomas had. I think Thomas fell to his knees. I, 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 I believe he must have f f uh, f uh, fallen, rather should be, to his knees in adoration as he realized who he was. He worships. And it's important for us to understand this reaction. What happened here was not just a case of this. Oh, oh, it is you, Lord. Oh, okay. Sorry, I got that wrong. It wasn't like that. No. You know how sometimes things happen and, and you, you suddenly, well, it happens a lot in my experience, you know, Molly said, and then I'll, oh, oh, right. Oh, you're right. Sorry about that. Yes. But it wasn't like that here, I don't think, for a moment. It's not, it wasn't that Thomas just was looking at the Lord and saying, oh, sorry, Lord, I got that wrong. No. There was a reaction. It's not there is a spiritual moment here, an understanding of who Jesus is that changed the whole of Thomas's life. My Lord and my God, he says. It's not an exclamation of surprise. It's a statement of understanding. That's important. It's not an exclamation of surprise. Oh, it's a statement, a statement of understanding. This is the connection that Jesus died on the cross for. This is the connection that Jesus wants with you and me. This is the connection of why the, Jesus went through what he did on the cross and rose again from the dead. It's not just to tick boxes and say, oh, I prayed a little prayer. God wants you to make a connection, to have that revelation to understand who God is and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Oh, that revelation that changes you from the inside out. Not just a, a little prayer, Lord, I'm a sinner, you know, forgive me, and then off you go and do whatever, but a change, a revelation of something powerful. Peter had that revelation. Matthew 16, it says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. It's a revelation. Saul, on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, fell to the ground. Who are you, Lord? He understood that the presence of God was in that place. The revelation. And then finally, the declaration by Jesus. And I love this uh, declaration because it includes me. And it includes you. Wow. It's not just for the the apostles, the disciples, the Christians that were in Jerusalem on that day and on that time. He says, you believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who haven't seen me and believe anyway. That is fundamental, isn't it? And it's brilliant because I know that I'm included. Hallelujah. I know that you too can be included. Every one of us need to understand that, that no one needs to be excluded. Every one of us have that opportunity because we don't see Jesus in the flesh. But the Word of God says, blessed are those who have not seen me, but yet believe. It's all about belief. It's all about faith. Here's a quote from the Bible exposition commentary, which I thought was really brilliant. It is not necessary to see Jesus Christ in order to believe. Yes, it was a blessing for the early Christians to see their Lord and know that he was alive, but that is not what saved them. And that's the crucial phrase there. My friends, are you saved this morning? Do you know the power and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation in you personally this morning. And it's important for you to know that you can know that, that you can have that, you can understand it for yourself. It says that, it says here, and it's, I'll read it again because I believe it's so important. It says this, it says, yes, it was a blessing for the early Christians to see their Lord and know that he was alive. But that is not what saved them. They were saved not by seeing, but by believing. Hallelujah. They believed that moment of revelation. They realized who Jesus was and believed. Hallelujah. The emphasis throughout the Gospel of John is on believing. On believing. A wonderful verse in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes on Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah! Praise God this morning for that wonderful promise, eternal life, everlasting life in Christ. Praise God. There are nearly 100 references in this gospel, to believing in Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that absolutely amazing? And I trust this morning, as we are thinking about Thomas and realizing that, yes, we too have doubts. There are times in our experience when we think, is that even possible? Can that really be true? That we can turn to the one who will take away all doubts and in their place come and say, peace be to you. Let's bow in prayer together for a moment. Just as we bring our message to a conclusion this morning, I want to encourage us. There may even be some who are watching uh, online at some point, even in the future perhaps, and who don't know this Lord Jesus Christ that we are preaching and talking about so much. But you can. The Word of God is clear that God wants you to get to know Him personally. He wants you to have that understanding and revelation that will take away all sin and forgive us and give us that wonderful relationship through Christ Jesus, death and resurrection with 
Father God Himself. And I want to encourage us this morning. Let's cast aside all doubts and believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is alive, the Son of the living God, and is able to forgive us for all sin. Are you ready to come to him? He cries out, come all who are weary and heavy laden. Are you weary or heavy laden this morning? Then come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And throw yourself at his feet and cry out to him. And he will wash away all stain, all sin. He'll wash away all doubt and all fear. He'll wash away all weariness and refresh you this morning. Father God, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and the way in which you planned that great and amazing plan to send your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to die on the cross to take the punishment for our sin and our wrongdoing and give us the opportunity to know the blessing of God, to know the peace of God, to know the refreshing flow of God. So lift up our spirits and we commit ourselves to you this morning, knowing that you are the one who will do all things in us and for us. Accept our thanks again afresh this morning, Father God, through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.